What's up, G Show Land, and welcome to another episode of the G Show Podcast. I am G1, and this is the Geek Out, episode 7, The Geek Awakens. I had to throw that in there. I'm sorry. <laughs> I had to do it. Oh, what's good, ladies and gentlemen? Another week, another geek. Here we go. It's just me and C Monty today, a very short, I mean, not short, a very small um, panel, but it's packed nonetheless. Uh, we had a lot of things to go. A lot of things to talk about, and I want to, um, first of all, just say, what's up, Chris, man? How you doing, brother? I'm good. I'm good. Just chilling. You ready to geek out? I'm always ready to geek out. All right, well, let's get this done on the... I'm ready to geek out. What's that? <laughs> Some people would say I'm too ready to geek out. <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> Welcome to the party, Hal. Um, let's start off this Mother's Day weekend with uh, Superman's mom, Diane Lane. Talking some smack, apparently, about Justice League and Avengers. Now, <clears throat> the other night, she was on some talk show. Uh, I don't keep up with these things, so I don't know. <clears throat> uh, or she was on Andy Cohen's show, okay? So I'm just read this here, what she said. She was asked for spoilers for Justice League and whether she thought the film was better than the Avengers. And then Diane Lane replied, no and no. She laughs. And then she says, short but honest, I hate to disappoint. Now, just in that context, because there's more to the story, but just in that context right there, Chris, let me ask you, what did you take from that? I mean, what I took from that was, like, for starters, you know, he asked for some spoilers, and she said no. So no, she's basically saying, no, I'm not going to give you any spoilers. Everyone knows that. When these people go on these interviews, like they're talking about the comic movies and everything like that, they ask them for information. They're always going to say no, but you kind of feel obligated to ask, right? Like you, it's like that kind of like tease kind of thing. Like you know you're not going to get an answer, but you're going to ask anyway. As far as like the whole thing, because I've been seeing a lot of articles like to oh, Diane Lane says that like says that uh, Justice League is going to be terrible, and she's saying that she hates it. Like, listen, I think so many people are taking the shit out of context, man. Like, they asked, do you think Justice League is better than Avengers? And she said no. That doesn't mean she thinks that Justice League is a terrible movie, just that she doesn't think it's better than Avengers. I don't think certain movies are better than other movies, but it doesn't mean I hate them. I don't think that Frozen is better than Moana, but I still love Frozen. Like, that's just the quickest thing I can think of a comparison and everything like that. But it's like, just because you don't think that one movie is good as another... It doesn't mean that you think the other movie is bad. But at the same time, it's kind of a low benchmark because Avengers wasn't really all that great to begin with. You're bugging. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, so for a movie to be lower than Avengers kind of doesn't set like, you know, a high bar of expectation for me. But um, well, yeah, I think that's just what it is, is that, you know, she, she at, they asked her an honest question. She gave us some honest answer. And people kind of took it out of context. It was making it seem like she said that, like, you know, Justice League was a bad movie. That's not what she said. She just said, in terms of, do I think Justice League is better than Avengers? No. Yeah, I hear you. I, I totally disagree with you. I think Avengers still to this day is, for me personally, the best comic book movie I've seen. Just it, it, as a, it, it just in a pure form of comic book geekdom. But, um, yeah, I agree with you. I, I think it, it was taken out of context. Especially because I think later on, her representatives came out and said she's never even seen the Avengers. So how can she even base it off of that? You know, if anything, maybe she's going by uh, she's judging critical response from Batman v Superman. And maybe she has an idea of, you know, box office take. I mean, I don't know. This is all speculation. But, um, yeah, I think people took it way out of context. I, I mean, she does it straight up says no and no. <clears throat> and she laughs, you know, sure, but honest, I hate to disappoint. No, I, I'm not disappointed. I know Marvel fanboys went batshit crazy about it. And DC fanboys went batshit crazy about it in their own separate way. Marvel for like, yeah, of course it's not going to be in DC for like, oh, fuck you. You know, what are you talking about? Personally, I don't think it's going to be better than the Avengers. And everything I've seen so far uh, uh, leading up to Justice League has not, you know, thrilled me in any way, you know, which way. And at the end of the day, I'm I'm more of a DC fanboy than I am Marvel. I just... DC hasn't done anything cinematically that, that really knocked me out since Man of Steel. Man. Um, so, 
But so she says all that, and then the her comments were reportedly misconstrued uh, because Diane Lane's representatives, for clarification, chimed in and said, and I quote, Diane meant sorry to disappoint in reference to revealing anything concerning Justice League that is not already out in the public and was declining to comment on a film, The Avengers, that she has not yet seen. She is thrilled to continue her role as Martha Kent and appreciates your excitement for Justice League. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to clarify this. You know, what do you think about that? I mean, it makes sense. It makes total sense and everything like that. You know, some people might call that they're going to people to try and fuel the flames of like this whole thing. They're going to call it backpedaling and everything like that. But I think that's it's honestly what it was like. It was an offhand comment that she made that, you know, these new sources are starting to take out of context and everything and trying to build up this build up like this intensity for clickbaits and getting views so they can get more hits on their articles and get those sweet, sweet advertisement dollars and everything like that. And it's like. Yo, y'all gotta stop doing this. You gotta stop taking these things out of context and trying to blow them out of proportion. This is what got Biggie and Pop killed. Knock it off. Like, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. I <laughs> look at you brought in the Biggie and Pop. That's sad but I mean, true. No, it's it's an offhand kind of joke, but it is partially true. It's like you look at that, and, and I'm not trying to turn this into like a thing, but like, no. you look at what happened in that scenario where these two people had like a personal beef, but then like the media started amping it up and, you know, East Coast versus West Coast and everything like that. And cats from New York and L.A. was out there killing each other over, like, who their favorite rapper was and which one was right and which one was wrong. And it's just just the media was being irresponsible and that went to an extreme, but it's, like, the same thing here. Like, within the geek culture, stop trying to amp this divisiveness between people's preferences and everything like that just so you could sell more ad space on your website and everything like that. Like you said, you know, like, I'm a DC fan, too. I'm a DC fan and a Marvel fan and everything. Like you said, personally, I don't feel that the DCEU has really done anything that, like, excites me or, like, I don't think they've done anything particularly great with their franchises so far. I'm hoping they do better in the future because I really do want to see those characters shine and I want to see those movies shine. It's not because I hate DC. It's because I hate with what Warner Brothers is doing with the DC properties right now. But that aside... Like, I love DC and Marvel. Why can't I enjoy both? Why are you trying to make me pick sides? I agree. I think, You know, it's funny. I have this conversation with my best friend all the time. Um, we go back and forth. And he's a DC fanboy, too. Uh, but it's funny because I, I, I'm a diehard DC fan, and, and he defends Marvel. But recently, roles have been kind of reversed because... And now, this is comic book talk, but... The shit that's going on, the controversy within Marvel Comics with them now rebooting, just their sales plummeting, and and you know basically the Marvel fans for the past uh, a couple of decades, if you will, coming out saying, "Yo, what have you? What are you doing to our characters? And why? Why is there always another number one? Just crazy shit." And it's funny because I'm like defending Marvel, and he's not. Uh, uh, anyway, way off topic. Jumped crazy across the board there. DC and Marvel fans, you can like each other. You know, you can like both things. That's the way I look at it. That's the way you look at it. That's the way everything should be looked at. Um, but yeah, uh, hopefully, and it, it will sound like it's backpedaling. It is. It, it's so funny how this controversy, quote unquote, in a geek world, mirrors some of the controversy, quote unquote, in the real world right now with a lot of backpedaling and he said, she said type shit that mirrors in the real world. I don't know. It's crazy. I like to get lost in these uh, fictional worlds so I don't have to deal with that shit. And I don't need no goddamn conspiracy theorists theories coming up now in my geek out realm. That's just the way I look at it. Exactly. This is like, for me, it's just like, because like, obviously when I saw the thing pop up in my Facebook news feed and I saw the, the headline, like I was curious like you know it wasn't so much like when they said oh diane lane trash is just like i was like yes let me you know look at this so i have you know something on my side for when i start talking shit about justice league and everything like that like oh even their main even one of their actors doesn't like the movie and everything. i was like what did she actually say because right off the bat i knew from reading the headline this is probably just some shit where she said like you know like 
some innocuous offhand comment and then so I checked it out and that's exactly what it was and I'm really tired of like these media outlets just taking things and blowing them out of proportion to get their clicks up so they could get more ever like you know just report the information yeah you could get you know, there's room in it to per, to share your personal opinion and everything like that and that's fine but don't sit and make stuff up whole cloth and like take things out of context just so you could just so you could sell more ad space or whatever like that. So it's the same thing. It's this, it's the regular news, like all these news outlets and media outlets gotta start being more responsible with the way they present their information. I agree. It's not cool. It's not cool. I agree one hundred percent. Um I mean look at the end of the day, I'm just looking forward to hoping, I'm hoping for the Justice League to be good. Again, the trailers aren't doing nothing for me right now. That can change. That can change. Uh, the way, for instance, my feelings have changed on the next topic, and that's Wonder Woman. Now, last week on the, on the podcast, I said I thought I saw the final trailer uh, when I went to see Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. That was not true. That was just a different trailer. The final trailer actually dropped this past week mm-hmm. and I gotta be honest I really like I said before had zero anticipation for this movie slowly but surely especially right now I'm really looking forward to Wonder Woman it has got me it's taken a while and that's probably due to the fact that a lot of the promotion didn't start happening until like the past two three weeks but yeah. for some reason right now it has got me I'm I'm, I bought into it. I bought into it. Still not so long, Gal Gadot, but she's tall. She's uh, uh, she's definitely got the physicality. I'm looking forward to seeing Wonder Woman. What did you think of this final trailer? Well, to be honest, because there's been so many over the recent months, like I get them kind of blurred in my head and everything like that. Yeah, I feel like I've seen this one. But I'm not 100% sure if I remember it compared to other ones that I've seen before. But, like, I've been sold on this movie pretty much since the first trail. Mm-hmm. Honestly. I, you know, I was sold on it because of the idea, like, you know, we've been talking for a long time about, not like you and me personally, but, like, the culture in general. I've been talking a long time about, you know, the need for female leads in superhero movies and everything like that. Like, I've been dying for a Black Widow movie. When they announced this, I was like, yes, finally. Then they announced the Captain Marvel movie, and I was like, yes, finally. You know, Not that I don't love my dude superheroes and everything like that, but variety is the spice of life, you know? Like, it is, it's cool, not just a sense of seeing something different and being able to see, some, you know, this what it's like to be a superhero and have superpowers presented from the female perspective. You know, how does that deal with, like, because they have different perspectives on... How would like that? So how would it affect their lives? You don't really get to see that in the mainstream the way you do with other superhero stuff. But also, just in the sense of like, it's just really cool to have these things for like this new generation, this new crop of geeks coming up and everything like that. Because it's always like superheroes and comic books has always been presented as a male thing. Like even. You always like, even though you always had female superhero and comic book and video game fans and everything like that, their characters were always kind of put off to the side and marginalized. They were like, you know, the secondary characters. They were like the damsel in distress and everything like that. It's cool now that we're getting more of a push for something for the for the young ladies out there who are into geek culture to relate to and look up to and aspire to and everything like that. So I was really happy when they announced this movie. That's a big part of what excited me about it. So that's why I was kind of sold from the get-go, because I was like, you know, especially now I have little baby cousins who are females, and, you know, obviously my ba- her, her older brother, I could go to him, like, let's watch, Bat- let's, let's watch Batman, and let's watch Superman, and all the cool geek stuff, and now I could go to her and be like, hey, you want to watch Wonder Woman and Supergirl and Batgirl, the Batgirl movie going to be coming out with Joss Whedon and everything like that, you want to watch Captain Marvel, and stuff that she can look up to and aspire to and, you know, be a part of that culture and everything. Um, so I was amped from this from the beginning, man, and I really hope that they got this one right, because the previous, you know, every DC movie that has come out since, like, Man of Steel has always been this thing for me, like, I was excited for it, and then it came out, and it was just, like, kind of like, eh, like, I was so hyped for Man of Steel, and even when I first went to go see it, 
I was like, I loved it. And then like as progressive as I watched, it, I was like, started picking it apart and everything like that. And that's when I kind of fell out of favor with it. Um, Batman versus Superman, you couldn't help but excited, get excited for that. Cause like yeah. you, people have been waiting for a world's finest movie for fucking ever, <laughs> forever, bro. Like true. <laughs> and we finally got it. And I was like, yes, you know, like even though Man of Steel might not have been the greatest. Like, you know, I'm still, it's Batman and Superman on the same screen together, man. Like, how can you not love that? And then it got closer and the view, the reviews started coming out. And it was like, oh, I think they dropped the ball again. And then I saw it and I was like, yeah, they definitely dropped the ball again. <laughs> yeah. And then the Suicide Squad, Suicide Squad thing happened. I don't want to dominate the conversation, but then I the, the Suicide Squad thing started happening. And at first I was like, eh. You know, because they're going to be like, you know, the whole serious no jokes thing and everything like that. And then that second trailer dropped and it was like that levity in there. And I was like, okay, this is going to be fun. Like they they learned from Guardians of the Galaxy that it's okay to be fun and irreverent. And Especially when you have villain characters, like you could just let them, do, they don't have to live up to that high standard. Like I take everything seriously and I'm here to save the world or whatever like that. So I was like, yes. And then it came out and I was like, got me again. <laughs> like, got me again, you see. <laughs> So, with those three movies kind of being disappointments and the Justice League trailer not really doing anything for me the same way you said it didn't do anything for you, I'm really hoping that Wonder Woman kind of gets things on track. Yeah. A couple of points there. One, you're 0 for 2 in my book as far as superhero movies go, Avengers and now Man of Steel. (laughs) Um, I I did really like it when it first came out. It was just like as I watch it more and more, like these little details started to crop up on me and everything. And that's funny you say that because I'm actually in reverse. I loved it when I first saw it, but I every time I watch it again, it, it's like, damn, I get to, I, I just love it even more. There's little things that I just aren't. Uh, and granted, I haven't watched Man of Steel in, since last year, since uh, BVS was coming out, but I, I've seen that movie more than a couple of times. And, and I, I do, I get, I get a kick out of it every single time. I enjoy that movie thoroughly. But everything else, though, is just like, what the fuck? I agree with you. Batman v Superman. Yeah, you kidding me? You're supposed to get excited. And I can't lie. The trailers had me hook, line, and sinker. All of them. I was like, yo! Even the one where they showed Doomsday. Yo! I didn't care. I did not care at all that they showed Doomsday. And I know that was a big topic of conversation when it happened. I didn't give a shit. I was like, fuck yeah, Doomsday. What? Granted, didn't like the look. But I figured maybe that was pre, you know, early Doomsday and hoping that you know, we got more than what we got as far as the bones coming out and shit. But, you know, that that all happened. I was psyched. I saw the movie. The first time I saw the movie, I came out of that movie. On one hand, I was thinking about the potential, right? With the cameos of Aquaman and Flash. I was thinking about that when Aquaman comes in and he goes, you got to save Martha or whatever the case may have been. I thought that was cool. But this, on the other hand... The rest of that movie was bothering me. Something was just aching. And then when I saw it again, like, two nights later, I was like, nah, I can't. This movie don't do it for me. This movie does not do it for me. It's not what it should have been. Same thing with Suicide Squad. Like you said, got that Guardians of the Galaxy vibe. I was like, okay, I ain't mad at that. Went to see it, though. It's like Guardians of the Galaxy times 100. Dude, tone the fuck. We, we, we spoke about this last week. Yeah. The overkill on the fucking songs. I mean, and again, I loved every single song they used in Suicide Squad. But fucking for real, dude, you played the whole fucking album. You know what I'm saying? We didn't need to hear it. It was annoying. It drove me nuts. The um, so now there's just like no coherency and story structure and character development. And everything it was none, just, none, and it was uninteresting. So now we, we get to this and, and, and echoing your point with the finally seeing female heroines on the screen. This should have happened a long time ago. I mean, Linda Carter was Wonder Woman for quite some time. You know what I'm saying? Uh, We've had her on TV. There were a couple of things, sitcom-wise, back in the days where they weren't afraid to do that. Look, take Buffy the Vampire Slayer, for instance. You know? Seven years and a humongous following. It's It was always there. Wonder Woman, though, is that character. Now, I'll echo in still. Um, in 2015, we we got a, a beautiful surprise in Star Wars with Rey. She's one of the, in my personal opinions, greatest female heroines I've seen on screen ever. I love Rey. I love her. 
you know? And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to continue that adventure this year, obviously. Uh, but Wonder Woman is here and, yeah, I want to be able to take my daughter and I want my daughter to be able to really, like, come out of that theater blown away. Not just by the movie, but by the prospect, you know? Granted, exactly. we're not getting superpowers anytime soon, but just the prospect of her saying, you know what? This woman took a shot, a chance, went to do something to better the world. And in that context, if she can learn from and take that and go forward in life, I'm happy. And, I, and, and, and like I said, man, I had zero interest in this movie, but the, the seeing that trailer in the big screen and then this final trailer that dropped this week, my anticipation for this flick is, yeah, it's there. It's not through the roof. But yeah. I'm, 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 I can touch the ceiling. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. So, yeah. All right. Well, jumping from that trailer to another trailer that dropped um, today. I know Matt was really excited for this. And he's a, he was a little bummed out that he couldn't make it today because he wanted to talk about it. But the Blade Runner 2049 trailer, official full trailer, dropped also this week. Mm-hmm. Now, <clears throat> before we talk about the trailer... Have you seen the original Blade Runner? And what what did you think of that movie? Um, I have seen it. I, it was a while ago. I'm probably going to have to go back and revisit it to refresh my memory of it and everything like that. Um, I did like the philosophical angle of it. Right. You know, like, you know... Yeah, and these are themes that get explored a lot in sci-fi and everything like that. Like, you know, what makes a person, like, what makes someone human? What's the difference between... Yeah, something with we created artificial intelligence and everything like that. Like, where do we draw that line between respecting that consciousness and you looking at it as like a tool and a machine and everything like that? And these are like you know really cool themes and everything. And then at the end, where there's like that kind of ambiguity, sort of like whether or not Deckard himself was a replicant or whatever. Well, I'm not even sure if like they've come out and fishies and he would. But, like, because I don't... It's not one of those movies where, like, I followed that closely. I wasn't, like, a huge fan of it like some people are and everything. Right. Um, I definitely do got to revisit. So I'm not sure if they've actually come out and say, oh, Decker was definitely a replicant and everything. Which it does seem kind of odd because, like, in this movie, it almost kind of seems to undermine that thing, just the fact that Harrison Ford is still alive. Mm-hmm. Because, like, the le- the replicant lifespan is supposedly... He should have been well past his expiration date. But then at the same time, like... Because didn't um, Rucker Howard's character kind of figure out a way, if I remember correctly, he figured out a way to extend their life or whatever like that, so maybe that's why he's still around. Um, but getting past all like the, the details of the storyline and everything, I'm, I'm excited about this. I'm excited because I'm a fan of Ryan Gosling. I'll admit that. I think that the dude's got a lot of charisma and everything like that. And even though he tends to choose roles where he's just kind of like with that blank roll that blank stare in his face and they're trying to look really intense and everything i dig it i dig that about the dude and everything i dig his charisma and i think he'll do he'll bring a lot to this movie and i think it'll be a good like passing of the torch thing again for him because i think harrison ford's getting to a point now where like he knows he's like this beloved I- icon in sci-fi movies like blade runner indiana jones star wars but now he's kind of like you know i know this is what i'm loved for but i kind of want to pull away from this now so i'm gonna start passing the torch on to new actors and giving the hand in the franchises over to them so i think we'll get a lot of cool moments out of that um i think this is a good vehicle for jared leto there's there are certain things that like jared leto is good at there's certain things that he's not good at and i feel like this kind of movie fits the bill of what he's kind of good at so i'm looking forward to see what they do with his character like i'm, I'm excited about it. i'm gonna definitely go back and rewatch the original refresh my memory and just i can't wait to see what they do with this movie I tell you right now, I'd be on the opposite end of this uh, podcast. I'd be outnumbered definitely if there was more than just us two. Because personally, I've seen Blade Runners maybe 2001 was like the first and last time I watched it. I remember really nothing much from that movie. It didn't grab me. I had zero interest. And, you know, I understood what I was getting into at that time. I wasn't young and thinking I'm going to see Harrison Ford as Han Solo or Indiana Jones. I knew this was a different type of movie, uh, but I don't know. I'm, 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 you know, I guess, I guess I'm simple minded when it comes to shit like that. Like I said a couple of podcasts ago, I don't look at the philosophical nature of movies. I just go in to have a good time. Um, so you know, 
for me, Blade Runner was sort of forgettable. I mean, I love the uh, aesthetic of it and the music. It's something about that 80s synth music, that and that Terminator. And that's one of the things I loved about this trailer, the music and the, the aesthetic of it. Gorgeous. And, um... I mean, I, I don't, I, I'm not, I can't say I'm looking forward to this movie because I'm not, I, I wasn't a fan of the first one, but if, you know, as we near October and more and more promotional material for this movie comes out, it starts catching my attention. Cause I hear uh, from people who are fans of this film, who adore this film and hold it in high regards. I hear the, the same thing I heard back in 2009, I believe when Star Trek was coming out. And, and the Trekkies or Trekkers coming out in force saying, this isn't my Star Trek. This is more Star Wars than Star Trek. They don't want an action-heavy Blade Runner. They want a philosophical Blade yeah. Runner. They want a story-heavy Blade Runner. And in that regard, if it's like what, you know, J.J. Abrams' Star Trek was, I might enjoy this movie because, again, I don't go in for that philosophical aspect. I don't I don't go in for the meaning of life when I go into movies. I could get I go to church if I wanted that. You know, I'd go to church. I just want to go in and enjoy the ride. In this day and age. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna say I can respect that. Yeah, and in, in this day and age, like I said, the aesthetics and uh I take nothing away from any of the actors. I I agree. I like Ryan Gosling uh, a lot. Um and I like Jared Leto. You almost went over three, but I'm glad you you kept your mouth shut, cause <laughs> I like Jared Leto's Joker, and I know you don't. Um, but the I mean, Kevin McCoy just don't think that the Joker shop's a hot topic. <laughs> Yo, let's let's scratch the podcast and let's just bash Suicide Squad, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, um, no, but yeah, the the music. I love the music. I love the aesthetic. I love the cinematography. Um, this is the guy who directed Arrival, correct? Doing this movie? Uh, yeah. Okay, I love the Arrival. I love the Arrival. He did, um, why can't I remember the name now? The movie, the drug movie with Emily Blunt and um, Sicario? Josh Brolin. That was Sicario, right? Yeah. Okay. I, I didn't see that one yeah. either. Um, but yeah, man, I. I'm gonna give it a pass. Uh, uh, you know, I I'm open to the idea of seeing this movie, but I'm just not excited to see this movie. You know, I don't. I personally don't think you needed this movie at all. To be honest with you, this is almost forty years later. <laughs> you bringing this shit out? It's part of the nostalgia caching. Like, there's been a lot of nostalgia stuff coming out lately, and everything like that. It's a big part of, like, even though Stranger Things is in itself, a, for me, a great show and everything like that, it's a big part of why um, Stranger Things was such a huge hit, because it had that 80s nostalgia vibe to it and everything like that. There's a big market for that right now. It's why they're bringing out, like, they're redoing Jurassic, like, you know, Jurassic World is cashing in on Jurassic Park from 20 years ago, why we're getting all these live-action movies of classic Disney animated movies. You know, it's a big market for nostalgia, and that's part of what this is, but if you can get a good story out of it, then why not? The only thing I and, and I loved how you set up the next topic, but before we get into that, the nostalgia thing for a movie like this, Blade Runner was a flop. It was a flop in the theaters. It kind of flopped critically, it cult, but it became a cult classic. It became a cult classic, absolutely. But as far as everything else, you it ran off with the exception of Stranger Things. Um, these were kind of successful movies. The Disney adaptations, the original animations. All successful. Um, uh, Jurassic Park, successful. I mean, Star Wars and Indiana Jones to an extent. I mean, one can make an argument about Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, but that was their, you know, comeback. But Blade Runner was just there, you know, it was, just happened. And yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But again, your segue with Stranger Things. Is perfect because <laughs> on the next topic, Hellboy is getting an R-rated reboot from Neil Neil Marshall, who directed The Descent, which is one of the best horror movies I've ever seen, and starring starring David Harbour, who is the sheriff from Stranger Things. So, okay, let me ask you because I 
If I'm not mistaken, when this news dropped earlier this week, I think I messaged you and you you made a comment about Ron Perlman. What do you think about this news? And how do you feel about it? I'm be honest with you. Because honestly, when it first dropped, I was on the train, so I didn't really get a chance to open the article. I just saw that the headline said, like, you know, reboot of Hellboy and everything like that. So my immediate thing was, like, Ron Perlman's not Hellboy. I don't, I don't want no parts of it. Like, you know. But that's kind of like a joking thing because I keep an open mind if I feel like, you know, if the actor... And I do feel like David Harbour would bring something to it because aside from his performance in Stranger Things, like, I've seen this dude in a bunch of stuff, and I, th- I just think that he's got that kind of grizzled like that air of grizzledness to him that you would need for like a Hellboy kind of character and everything like so I'm you know I'm I'm willing to give him a shot and the fact that it's going to be R-rated is intriguing because that means you're going to get to see more of like the demonic kind of stuff like now I'm not really familiar with the Hellboy comics my experience with Hellboy has always been the Guillermo del Toro movies right that's the my knowledge of the character um I am a little disappointed that we're not going to get that third Hellboy movie from Guillermo del Toro. Just because, like, Guillermo del Toro has, like, really intriguing creature designs and, like, with his imagination with that and everything like that. So it was fascinating. And I really enjoyed um, The Golden Army or whatever the sequel was called. Um, I really enjoyed the first one. I think that Ron Perlman, like, that's when I, that's why I said that Ron Perlman and Buzz, because Ron Perlman really did, like, kind of set the standard of what that character is to me. But, you know, I can't hinge all myself. Like, like I said, I don't know if that, if that really was even an accurate representation of the character, because I don't know what the character is like in the books. He right. could have gotten it completely wrong. I don't know. Um, but that's the standard for me. But I think David Harbour could match that. And I th- I'm, you know, I'm willing to give it a shot. You know, I wasn't a huge fan of The Descent, but just because I didn't like the content of the movie doesn't mean the guy that the director isn't a solid director. Right. So with this is like for me, it's the same thing you said about Blade Runner 2049. It's a wait and see kind of thing. Gotcha. Gotcha. I, I'm I'm personally looking forward to it. My shockingly, my experience with Hellboy also comes just from the movies. And I think I watched one of the animated features, which also start the cast of the movie doing the voices. Um so, you know. But I, I mean, just the concept alone, Hellboy, it's, it's fucking dark. And Mike Mignola does some dark shit. I've got a couple of his, uh, his uh, works in other comics, like Batman, for instance, and it's really dark, dark stuff. His aesthetic, and that's one of the things Guillermo del Toro knocked out of the park. His uh, Mignola's creature creations, uh, del Toro brought those to life. Unbelievably, I. That's still to this day for me one of the best uh, representations from comic book to screen. Seeing Hellboy, I really am excited to see how they do this new version because I agree with you, David Harbour. I think he has that grit. He has that. While he's no Ron Perlman, he could be Ron, Ron Perlman Jr. Because yeah. what from what I saw from him in Stranger Things, he was. He's kind of an intimidating dude with a heart, though. And I think at the end of the day, that's what Hellboy was. Exactly. Um, so I, 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 I can't wait to see that. My, my thing is this, though. I, it's hard because I'm a big Selma Blair mark. Like, I fucking love Selma Blair, like, forever, you know? Um, and so not seeing her as Liz Sherman, it's kind of, oh, man, it's going to crack my heart. But who knows? Maybe they get that little girl from uh, the Pink Ranger, from Power Rangers, and, and pop her in there. You know, she's cute. Who knows? Um, or maybe they have to get a little ranger because I really like looking at her. <laughs> or maybe we should dive and talk about that because some kids are like 20 and this dude is going to be like, he's got to be in his 40s pushing 50. That's dangerous. That's yeah, but I mean, Ron Perlman was pretty, was pretty up there in age when he did Hellboy. And yeah, but some of Blair was in her 30s, maybe 40. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean. Too much. But comparatively, you know. <laughs> My cousin, get the girl in the movie, man. <laughs> my cousin used to have a really bad saying. He used to, uh, he used to say, "If she's old enough to pee, she's old enough for me." And that, oh my god, that's that's where I feel this conversation's going <laughs> down the drain. I got, I, got a whole, I got a whole bunch of those jokes that is going to take us way off topic. And this, yeah, no, <laughs> stick it on, stick it on topic. <laughs> what excites me is the R rating. Yeah, it really does because again, the, the just. 
Hellboy as a concept. It just, your mind goes all over the place. Um, I read a small thing before we started, uh, like story beats. It's, I forgot what it's called. I think the blood queen or curse of the blood queen, something like that. Um, and, oh man, basically it was like this, uh, English witch, uh, and I forgot the, the, the era, but she rips hearts out. So, you know, that. I'm, I'm ready to see that. I just want to see if they... See, with, with um, Neil Marshall, with The Descent, those subhumanoid creatures scared the shit out of me. He he got the jump scares, and they were vicious-looking things. Just this... Being underground in those hills, in that claustrophobic nature, in the dark, he said such a vibe and such a tone that... I could totally see that fit right into this Hellboy universe. You know, this just claustrophobic, dark, scary nature that you don't know what's lurking, you know, in the darkness. And again, the R rating, I'm, I'm really, because I've, I've, I've always been a, a, a huge proponent of R rated movies. I love him, love him, love him, love him. Like, yeah. the harder the R, the better to me. Um, with a... With the comic book movies with Deadpool and this year's Logan, especially Logan, just rip it, like knocking it out the park in, in, ter in terms of comic book R-rated films. Hellboy, I think, is just going to fit this mold perfectly, more so than a Venom movie would. Yeah. See, like, that's that's the thing to me. And where I, this is kind of what I tried to hint at when we first had that conversation a few casts ago talking about the R-rated Venom movie and everything. Because, like, for me... The R rating isn't necessarily in terms of like the violence, because for me, I could get the same impact out of implied violence that I can out of like actually. So when you see the scene in Apocalypse Wolverine where the Jean Grey lights Wolverine now, he's slicing, I don't actually have to see him spewing guts and everything like that. For me, knowing that he's cutting the people up and then he, he stabs the one dude and they cut away from him, stabbing the dude, you see the blood splatter on the wall. That's good enough for me in terms of capturing how violent of a person he is. Where it comes from me with low with the R rating is where it embodies the character. Like Logan is someone who's a dark person who's gonna curse a lot and do like more. Same thing with Deadpool. You need an R rating for Deadpool because Deadpool's gonna say fuck and dick and shit and all that stuff a lot. And you can't like in a PG thirteen movie, you might get away with one or two fucks or three, maybe five maximum fucks. But Deadpool's gonna be saying that shit all the goddamn fucking time. See, I'm slipping into Deadpool mode right now. This, uh, this podcast is an R-rated. R -rated. Uh, <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. So I feel it's the same thing with Hellboy. Hellboy's like that, that kind of grizzled Wolverine-esque kind of character where he's going to say, like, what the fuck was that shit? Like, a lot. You know, like, or fuck this guy a lot. And everything like that. So you, that's what you need the R-rating for. For me, is the more than the actual violence. Because I'm fine with implied violence. That's why I said I didn't really need an R-rated Venom movie because I'd be good with the, the implied violence in Venom and Venom doesn't strike me as a kind of character who's going to be like Fox Spider-Man like it's like yeah no I agree so it's really about language it's about allowing them to get away with the language a lot more yeah I say and I, I agree with that too because I again <laughs> the more fucks in the movie the better I feel about life I just that's I like it I don't care it's just uh, that, that's the type of shit I like. I I grew up in an age where I got to see. I'll put it like this: We went to go see Short Circuit Two, right? Short Circuit Two was sold out. So, and back then you couldn't reserve tickets like we can now. So instead of leaving the theater, my father said, "Well, let's go see this instead." And yeah. I was introduced to Die Hard, my favorite action movie of all fucking time. I don't care that first Die Hard. And it was from that moment in that movie that I was like, yes, rate it all forever, forever. Because that was just, the, the to me, that's the best fucking package in the world. I love Die Hard. But um, yeah, no, I totally agree. Venom will not be saying, I'm going to fucking rip your head off. Fuck you, Spider-Man. Like, that's just not the character. Whereas, like I said, Logan fit the bill perfectly, especially because he's old, he's broken, he's been through hell and back. And he just, yeah, it fit the bill. And I guess I could see Hellboy the same in the same vein. Although it's going to be gruesome. Yeah, because that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't really need the gruesomeness. Because, like, you take a look at Spider-Man 2. 
right? And that scene when they're doing the operation on Doc Ock and he tears up the uh, he tears up the operating room, like the tentacles kill all the people and everything like that. That was one of the most intense violent scenes I've seen probably in a comic book movie to date. And it was all just like implied violence. There wasn't like gruesomeness. And Sam Raimi was able to pull that off in a PG-13 rate. You know, obviously, like, well, I can't say it's the most like gruesome scene that I've seen, like the violent scene in the comic book movie, but it's it's up, up it's up there, and it's all without having to see blood splatter and guts and everything everywhere. Right. So you could you could do a good job with the violence and the gruesomeness and everything like that without actually do it with the right director, like someone like a Sam Raimi was able to pull it off in a PG-13 movie. So you don't really need the R rating for that. Right. I'll tell you another reason, though, why during this course of the conversation, I got even more excited about the R rating for Hellboy because if they do cast Yellow Ranger as Liz <laughs> I might be able to see her boobs. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You don't, you don't get boobs in a PG-13 movie. Oh, my God. <laughs> Call me a misogynist if you want. But I want to see her boobs. <laughs> you know, ten minutes ago he's praising Wonder Woman and how the female. He's, and here we are, the point of conversation where it's all. Let me see the Yellow Rangers. <laughs> I'm a complex man, and I will not apologize. For that. <laughs> oh man! Oh, God. I will not be defined by just one aspect of my personality. Oh man, I, that's a good laugh. It says early. It's early Saturday morning. That was a great laugh. <laughs> You, my friend, you, you're a freaking psycho, brother. <laughs> oh, man. Speaking of psychos and all ratings, something else that dropped this week that was actually really fucking perfect. Right up your alley, as a matter of fact. I know you love this team, if you will. Deadpool announced that they're getting, it's getting an animated uh, show on FXX from Donald Glover. Your boy, Donald Glover. Now that's first off, Deadpool on a network where you can get away with a lot more than you can on just regular FX. And then of course, Donald yeah. Glover, who basically is pretty much doing no wrong in Hollywood as of late. Your thoughts? As uh, soon as I saw Donald Glover's name attached to the project, that's all I needed. Even if I hated Deadpool as a character, which I don't, you know, I'm one of those people who loves like the the R-rated Bugs, Bugs Bunny aspect to his personality and everything. I love that. Um, even if I hated the character, I would have been so on board with this just because Donald Glover's name is attached. Now, I don't know how heavily involved he is. If he's just like, you know, he's kind of like a producer thing and he's just bringing it to the screen. Or if he's like actually going to be writing and doing voice work and stuff like that. I don't know. Because he's got a lot of stuff going on. And that's one of the things I admire about Donald Glover is he is just what industrious as hell. Like he's all over the place doing all kinds of different projects and just, you know, channeling his creative creativity as much as possible. Like, you know, I look, I think he might actually be slightly younger than me, but like, I, I look up to him. Like that's, that's my icon right there. I wish I could be more like Donald Glover. Um, I remember one of the lines in his song said, I'm not going to stop until they say James Franco is the white Donald Glover. Because <laughs> you know how Frank goes all over the place and stuff like he's you know going to school, he's teaching at NYU and stuff like that. So he's like, I'm not going to stop. So they say John, De, um, James Frank was the white Donald Glover, and I feel I think we've more than surpassed that point now, where like Donald Glover is that benchmark yeah. for like who creative people should be aspiring to be in terms of like industriousness and everything like that. So I'm super amped about this. I'm really looking, you know, having a Deadpool show. Um, it might be a little bit more intriguing if Ryan Reynolds was involved, just so like it would be tied more into the movies, which would be crazy. That would have been a cool thing. Uh, who knows? Maybe, maybe something because like this is just the announcement; it's in development right now. So who knows? At certain point, like you know, Ryan Reynolds said, like we'll come out and say, "Hey, I'll do the voice work, and we'll tie it into, we'll tie it into the universe or whatever like that." We don't know if that's going to come out of this, um, but I'm excited about it. And just anything that boosts Donald Glover's profile, I'm gonna. I'm going to be all into because I'm a super hard fanboy for this dude. Like, like that's that's my man crush right there. I, <laughs> I flat out say it. That's my man crush right there. I look up to the dude. I admire the dude. And just anything that's going to boost his profile and make him more famous and make him more successful, I'm all for it. I feel you on that, man. I like Donald Glover a lot also, bro. I think he's one of those... 
he's the rock. He's the mini version of the rock. When you say he's industrious, he's all over the place. He's working. That's what the rock does. That dude don't stop. And Donald Glover creatively is, he's almost unparalleled, you know? He is just that good. So seeing his name involved with a character that actually, and I've went on many a times, uh, uh, saying that I don't care for Deadpool like that. I love the movie. The movie was hysterical. Uh, everything I wanted from a, a zany, like you said, Bugs Bunny-esque type of uh, comedy, rated R, I loved it. So the animated series, even if his name wasn't attached to it, I would have been like, you know what, just because of where it's coming from, yeah, let's let's get this going. But then you see Donald Glover's name, and you're like, okay, because this dude is funny, too. He's funny. Yeah. Man. So... <laughs> the the prospects of this show just where is his mind at in regards to this that's what I'm looking forward to the most I, I see this show as like a little bit harder than Archer and Archer's a fucking lunatic fringe yeah. show that's a crazy show but I, I, I think we're gonna get some something a little bit darker and, and I don't mean darker in terms of oh it's too heavy but I just mean like in terms of just it's Deadpool, the violence alone in cartoon form. What, yeah. what we're going to see is going to be insane. Yeah, and see, you touched on another thing because that is true that before Deadpool became like this zany and reference character, like that, his original backstory was kind of like tragic. Yeah. You know? So, you know, this whole thing about he got cancer and he was near death and everything like that. So I do think that, like, with Donald Glover at the helm, you might see some of those darker themes explored. Because they touched on it in the movie and everything like that, but the movie kind of went more towards the the zaniness and the irreverence of it and everything like that. Like, you know, you did get a bit of the tragedy of it, but it was more about the comedy. And I think with Donald Glover at the helm of this animated series, you might see some of the more darker themes explored. But you also get the balance of the comedy because, like you said, Donald Glover is also funny as fuck. So I'm excited about it. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so am I. Something else I'm looking forward to, staying on TV topics, Judge Dredd was announced that it's getting a TV show. Now, that, that, because, I look, I loved Dredd. Carl Urban and Dredd, I, I'm mad that I didn't see that in theaters. I really should have. Um, I yeah. was put off by the whole 3D thing because I'm not a big fan of 3D. Yep. And that's what you've seen it in theaters and everything like that. But when I saw it, finally saw it at home. I was like, oh man, I should have gotten this and I should have seen it in 3D. Now I'm lucky, I'm lucky that I have one of those 3D TVs and one of those, you know, 3D Blu-ray players. So I, I watched it when I bought it, bought that 3D package, and oh man. I mean, just, my TV is not, you're not gonna get the same experience you would, let's say, in IMAX, but my yeah. TV does the job, and I'll tell you, man, the 3D in that blew me away the way like when I saw Avatar in 3D in the theaters. I was blown away, and I hate 3D. I don't like it at all. But yeah. I'm happy about this news because I think Dread is one of the most, uh, dare I say, dreadfully underrated <laughs> movies ever. It is so good. I really wish more people would got you know get on that and see it because it, that was an R-rated comic book movie too, and worked and worked. The vi- yeah. it was more violence. Than, than it was the um, actual language. There is language in the movie, but the visceralness of that film, I wanted a sequel. But I'll take the yeah. TV show. My hope, my hope is that Carl Urban comes back and plays Dread because he was on Fox on a TV show before, um, it was called Almost Human. And I fucking love Great that show. show. Yes! Yeah, they dropped the ball on that show. Good man. lord! Fox is constantly dropping the ball on their sci-fi properties, man. They did it with Serenity. Well, it was called Firefly, in fact. But they did it with the Firefly franchise. They did it with Dollhouse. They did it with Almost Human. They did it to Fringe. Yeah. They did it to Fringe. Even though... At least Fringe was able to carry all the way to the end, though. Yeah, but... <laughs> Yeah, but it still sucked from season three on. That's just my personal opinion. But Almost Human was so fucking good. And I'm sitting here like, why? You have two amazing actors on the screen. You got Derek Jeter's girlfriend. And the story was tight. So if, let's just say... because There's episodes out of order and certain things weren't making sense. 
like one episode they're best friends and then the next episode they're back to like being enemies because that episode where they were enemies was supposed to happen before the episode where they were best friends. Yeah. Fuck Fox. Fuck, fuck Fox as a channel. Yeah, I, 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 I do tend to stay away from Fox, but um, I still like The Simpsons. Uh, but I, I, I honestly, if Carl Urban would come back and play Dread on, on the show, I think that show now has, um, it has the potential to last more than one season. It has the potential to go, let's say, five. To me, five, five seasons is fine too, um, especially because you figure Carl Urban is a movie star. We're gonna see him in Thor Ragnarok. Um, but yeah, that that's how I feel. I, I love this news that you know Judge Dredd is coming to TV. I love, I love Judge Dredd. I've read some of its comics. I've got all of the Batman crossovers, which are fucking great. And aside from the Sylvester Stallone thing, Dread the movie was fucking phenomenal. So yeah, I'm I'm totally on board and looking forward to this, man. What about you? I, I absolutely the same thing as you, man. Like I love the Car Armin Dread movie. Didn't hurt that Olivia Thurbley was in it because she's yeah. another actress that I have a crush on. She's um, smoking. Wood Harris was awesome in the movie. Fucking, uh, why am I drawing a blank on her name now? Lena Headey. Uh, she Lena was Lena Headey. Yep. She was. Yeah, Lena Headey. There you go. She was a really great villain in that movie, man. I loved her in that movie. Oh yeah. And just she's just a great villain in general. She's really good at playing bad women. Like <laughs> it's just like between between Mama and and uh, Cersei. Cersei Lannister, man. Like, but get, getting back on like you said, because I wasn't really, I never really read a Dread comic. I didn't see the Sylvester Stallone movie, so I was not, I was absolutely unfamiliar with Judge Dread specifically until that movie came out. And I went, I saw the movie. And when it first came out, I was kind of like, you know, a little off because, again, I wasn't a huge fan. And I was like, this just looks like The Raid. Yeah. And, you know, then I went to go see my... I sat down and watched it at my friend's house. And I was like, this is, like, one of the most gloriously violent movies I've ever seen. Like, it's one of those things... This is an instance where the R rating works for the violence because this is a movie where you need that extreme level of violence. <laughs> just because of the, the fascist undertones of, like, the, the judge corpse and everything like that. Like, the way they just beat people down to, like, say you can't break the law and everything. And um, I'm really excited, like you said, if they get Carl Urban to do this movie because he's the embodiment of Dread to me now, it's not to say that they can't find something. I'm sure there's another actor out there, someone that could capture that character. But it would be cool to do it. It's obvious we're not going to get the sequel to Dread that we've all been wanting. Right. So if they just do this as a continuation of the movie, it's not as like a direct sequel kind of scenario, but it's like a, a follow through on the movie that we saw and Carl Urban plays the character, I'm all for it, man. I am. Really am. Ah, man, that would flip my lip. I, I'd go crazy because that is it. He was perfect. He was perfect. And then one of the biggest things that, you know, that come out of that movie too, it's a minor thing, but it, you know, it makes fanboys really happy is the fact that he never took the helmet off. Dredd doesn't take the helmet off yeah. in the comics. It's, that's one of those things of the Sylvester Stallone movie, which never watch ever, you know, don't, I'm telling you, cause you would hate yourself. I saw that shit in the theaters because I like Judge Dredd and oh boy, yeah. oh boy. But, um, yeah, TV show, Carl Urban, Judge Dredd, I'm down. I want to see it. You know what I'm saying? Like, and then like you said. Even though we're not getting a sequel, if it would just be like a, a continuation, because it does, you don't need to continue from that. That was a perfect self-contained movie. There's nothing yeah. that needs to come out of that. There's nothing, nothing. Uh, 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 what the hell? There's no plot holes. There's no plot threads dangling that you need to tie up. Except for maybe if you wanted to go that route, the corruption in the in, in the police force and the judges. Because, you know, th those four judges came and tried to kick ass. But, yeah. Continue it. Same universe. Different day. That's it, you know. Give me Judge Death. That, if you, that is a mug for you. You've never, like, done any type of after Dread. You've never were interested in looking at Judge Dread shit. You don't really know anything about it like that. 
Yeah, I mean, I kind of was interested, but I just never, let's say, one of those things I just never kind of followed through on, but I might now. I tell you, man, they got some really kooky is the right word, characters in there, uh, that I'll give them props for in the first Judge Dredd movie with Sylvester Stallone. They brought, I think, there's a family of, like, redneck inbreds, but they're, uh, they're half machine. It's really weird. They have, like, implants and shit. Yeah. They did them in that movie, and I was happy to see that, but unfortunately, the movie just sucked, and they they, they were useless. It was just cool to see that, okay, they're taking cues from the comics, whereas Dredd really didn't do that. The only cues from the comic it took was his gun and his look and the motorcycle. That was it. That was it. And I ain't mad at that at all. But I would like to see Judge Death. Plus, like I said, if Mega City won, which is what I believe the titling the um the series, if that if it's a continuation of the Dread movie, then that means I get to look at Olivia Thoroughby some more. So <laughs> I'm all for that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what? She's actually older than the young Becky G, so I mean, I can't even knock you for that one. I cannot. But um, all right. Last thing on the agenda before we wrap this thing up. MTV had their little award show this past week, and they showed two uh, uh, what the hell am I looking? Two new scenes, I would say. Two scenes from two movies: Spider Man Homecoming and It. They had new looks at both movies. Real quick, what were your thoughts on either one, both of them? Did you see them? How'd you feel? Yeah, I watched them. Um, I mean, the Spider-Man one was just pretty much an extended clip from the trailer that we already saw when he comes into the house and his best friend sees him in the outfit and everything like that. So it didn't really add much in terms for me of what I was expecting because I was, you know, the scene pretty much played out the way I was expecting it to. Like, his friend sees that he's Spider-Man and he's kind of like, Hey, I'm trying to know, blah, blah, blah. It's pretty much, like I said, just like a 30-second longer version of what we already saw in the trailer. So it didn't really do anything new for me, but it's still a funny scene. And I'm looking forward to the movie either way. Um, the It tra- the it scene, I was more intrigued by because it gave us more of a glimpse of like the dynamic of the loser club and seeing these kids interact with each other and everything like that. And... Um, you know, with uh, the kid from Stranger Things, whose name escapes me, but is a really awesome name. It's like Wolf something. Yeah. Um, um, seeing him as Richie, the the class clown character from It and everything like that. You know, I think he he played it really well. Like he embodied that character quite well and everything. From what I know of the character from the book. Um, the Eddie character really well and. Just, Finding on look of Pennywise's face was intriguing. Um, so we'll see. Like I'm, I like to see they show the dynamic of the of the group together and everything. I'm kind of getting more and more excited about this movie. You know, I kind of wasn't at first because I was really looking forward to hopefully seeing the Carrie Fukunaga version. Right. But I'm I'm more I'm getting more pulled into it because like, I'm a huge fan of the book. Like I, that's one of my favorite Stephen King books. Of all time. I'm getting into this Dark Tower series right now and that's drawing me in, but it will still be one of my favorite all-time Stephen King novels. So I'm looking forward to it, man. I'm hoping I'm hoping to see more. That's what I wanted to and, and knowing that you've read the book and you love that and you love it. Uh, I, that's why I wanted to know like when you saw that scene, because I thought that scene was a really good um sequence because it wasn't a trailer, it was an actual scene, and I wanted to know from someone who read the book. You know, how did you feel in regards to it? Did, did it play out like that in the book? Were they being somewhat faithful? Uh, you know, but it seems like you dug it, you know? But how, how did that compare to the book for you? Well, it's still too early to tell. They got the characters right, but there's not enough of, like, what's going on in the scene to really determine for me to pinpoint exactly which scene. I, I, and I have to reread the book to, like, refresh my memory. Because I can't exactly pinpoint which specific scene that is that they're doing. They got the dynamics of the characters right. I'm intrigued of them putting the movie in more of a different time era because the book takes place, I believe, in like the late 50s going into the 60s. Right. Whereas this, they're setting it up in the 80s. The kids are in the 80s so that the modern-day adult part of the story can take place now Mm -hmm. in more current times, which I'm interested to see 
it's intriguing to me when they do finally do the adult story because how are they going to play with those themes of like modern technology factoring into the story? Because we all we all say those things like when we watch horror movies, oh well, if this dude had had a cell phone, the problem would be solved and the movie would be over in thirty seconds. Whereas, do we know that to be true with the supernatural elements of it and this guy's ability to like basically influence this whole entire town? Because that it really is on that level where the influence of it affects the whole time without anybody even really realizing it. And they just think that everything's normal and that's just how things go. And um, <clears throat> so when they did the original story where the kids grew up in the 50s and then they come back in like the late 80s going into the 90s, the technology that we have now wasn't as prevalent. So you could still get away with the whole thing while he was able to get this guy because he didn't have a cell phone. I'm interested to see how that plays in. Like, he has a cell phone, but it's still able to get him because he can fuck with the cell phone reception or whatever like that. It's going to be an interesting thing to explore. So it might not be 100% faithful to the book in terms of doing it in the same time periods, but it also makes it more intriguing because you get to see with how are they going to explore how that stuff works in a more modern time set. Yeah, I like that a lot, actually. It makes... It, it, it's perfect because, yeah, the supernatural aspect of it there definitely would be some cell phone malfunctioning going on. Yeah. And besides, if you're in the sewers, you shouldn't be able to get any reception regardless. So, you know. And it's like, just how does it, as the creature and supernatural abilities, utilize the modern technology to um, pawn out its influence and do its work and everything? Well, it, that reminds me of that one scene in Nightmare on Elm Street when she's on the phone and Freddie's talking. And next thing you know, Freddie's mouth is on the phone licking her face. Exactly. <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see stuff like that pop in the movie. Well, listen, man. I I personally dug what I saw there, too. I agree with you on the Spider-Man bit. And it was a, an extended scene. I liked him crawling on the ceiling and then coming down. And then, whoa, there's the shocking surprise. Cool shit. And the it thing, I am looking forward to it, man. I really am. I'm That's... That the movie big, is the big thing that pulled me in from the MTV stuff in regards to Spider Man was uh, Tom Holland's and Zendaya's lip sync battle. Oh, um, but it was amazing. <laughs> I tried to watch it. I can't lie. I tried to watch it. I chuckled, but then I was just like, I gotta get out of here. Just I don't like that song at all. So I, mean, I just I gotta get out of here. But um, speaking of getting out of here, we're gonna wrap this up. Y'all want to thank you, Chris. For hanging out with me today, we did this like G one on one style. Yeah. Um. Yeah, dude. Thanks again. Seven weeks in a row. I'm trying, man. I'm trying to be a consistent staple in the geek out. Oh. Well, yeah. Well, if he's not, you know, I will be because it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do this goddamn podcast by myself if I have to. <laughs> God damn it! I will have multiple conversations. I'll be like split. We'll talk about split like, next split, week. Uh, split screen shit. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're gonna talk you about on one side. You on the other? I got no problem with that. We're going to talk about Split next week. I've been trying to talk about this for like three weeks now, but we'll talk about it next week, definitely. Glass and Split and also all that fun X-Force stuff. stuff, because Maisie Williams got cast in X-Force. And, um, it was not X-Force. It was definitely New Mutants, and I'm like, okay, we're looking not, forward not, to that. Right, not, not X-Force, New Mutants, my bad. Yep. I got that. We're going to talk about that also next week, because um, that was something that I didn't see until late last night, and, well, the notes were already written, and I'm lazy. But anyhow... Also got the girl from Split in it. So. Yes, yes, indeed. That's why it reminded me. And she's playing a witch, in which she played a witch in The Witch that came out last yep. year. So that'll do it here. See, that's us geeking out. We know all this stuff, but we don't know her name. <laughs> <laughs> we're, try- we're trying to wrap this show up, and then things pop up, and like, no, we gotta keep talking. <laughs> it's like being on the phone with my mother. Mom, goodbye. All right, see you later, Mom. I gotta go. I love you so much. All right, Mom, I love you. Bye. Mom, I gotta say, give the baby a kiss for me. Mom, I gotta go. Mama, just oh, call your brother, Mom. That's the end of the show. Did you see that new trailer? Oh, God damn it, Bob. (laughs) (laughs) That'll do it for us. That's Chris. I'm G1. We out of here. Peace.